Okay, so um, I first kind of want to start more current, I guess. So I hear you're involved in a lot of veteran organizations. Um, yeah, I am. Yep. Yeah. What do you What do you do like within that? Well, we just like to get together. We once a month meetings and uh, with the uh, VFW and the Vietnam veterans, and then the other times we uh, meet for breakfast. I got three times a month we meet groups for breakfast. We just sit around and talk and you know pass the uh, BS around. And, you know all the old branches of the service, Army, Navy, Marines, and we just everybody's good friends and we just have a good time for a couple hours. I think uh, the last time we met, there were like 40 people there. All, all different life stories and everything else. But it's nice to, you know, nice to get together. Yeah. So do you do it to, do you do it to like stay in touch with some people? Because I know grandpa said that you're, you're still in touch with a lot of the people that you were in the war with. Well, I, years ago, many years ago, I tracked down the guys who were, for my tank crew, the driver, the gunner, the tank commander. Did that mm -hmm. one picture there with the guy holding the flag? Yeah. Yeah, he was my tank commander. And the, the other two guys were my uh, driver and loader. I think the uh, the driver was the guy uh, standing next to him. Remember that picture? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and the gunner was, uh, he was the guy, the three of us sitting on top of the turret, and I was blowing smoke rings, and the gunner was the guy in the background. He, when he came home, he was also a police officer in, in Ohio. Oh. So we had a lot in common. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, so I guess more about, like, on the war front, um, and feel free to chime in whenever. Um, you were definitely there really early in the war because you got drafted in 65. 65, October 65. Yeah, so what did you expect before you went to war? Because like not many people knew much, I guess, then. Well, I, you know, it was like a whole different stuff. And, you know, it was, it was a, Difficult transition. Everything had to be done in by uh, somebody's telling you what to do all the time. You know, the, not that my parents didn't keep an eye on me too. <laughs> but uh, you know, the, we didn't know what to expect really because I went over with the regiment. There had never been any armored units over there before us. So we uh, we kind of wrote the book on jungle warfare for tanks and stuff. Oh really? Yeah, we had to uh, we had to see what we can do, what what our limits were, and what we could accomplish. Yeah, we used to go. Uh, we line up five tanks abreast and go cross country, knocking down trees and driving over them. And the infantry guys were in uh, armored personnel carriers; they'd follow around in our know, tracks. But we, you know, we led the way. We a lot of times we just happened upon enemy base camps. You know, we find that, you know, they, they hear us coming a mile away. They fled, but they left all of their stuff behind. So we had to find their equipment and weapons, ammunition, and we either backhaul it out or destroy it in place. But, you know, that, that was about it. The, the worst problem we had when we hit a tree, we had a nest of ants up in the tree that come down and land on the top of the tank, and like thousands of these red ants would scatter. And, you know, I used to have a gun in one hand and bug spray in the other hand, so, so we'd all be jumping around spraying each other with the bug spray to, to kill all the air, because they bit. They hurt. Yeah. And you got hundreds of them on you. And it takes a while with a bug killer to, to, to uh, kill them all. So. Yeah, that doesn't sound very pleasant. Um, yeah. Is that, like, typically what you did um, in the war? Cause like I read the stuff, but like, what was a typical day for you? I guess. Well, yeah, you know, like we had several different things. We they rotate uh, us in and out of base camps. We used to guard a uh, 
one engineering camp where they made the they crushed rocks to build highways with. You know, they uh, they were the engineers. They didn't have their own security, so we would rotate in and out for a couple of weeks. Then there's like we used to do convoy escorts. Some of the pictures you have there were lined up with all the trucks. Mm -hmm. We'd escort the convoy, uh, the trucks down the road, make sure they got there safe. And most of the time we were, you know, going through the jungle. That was our main main thing. And uh, every once in a while, we'd have to go in for maintenance. It's a, it takes a lot of maintenance to keep those things going. Yeah, I bet. Um, I guess my like other question about that is: so you had like only there were only four of you in one tank. Were you really like close with the people in your tank? <laughs> <laughs> I assume you were. I mean, yeah, but like, what was that like? <laughs> Well, I, I, I grew up with two older brothers, so I, it wasn't too much different. But no, you live, you actually live and sleep and work together. You, you At night, every night we had to do guard duty around the clock. And, uh, you know, where if, you, if you had to go to the bathroom, you had to take a guy with a machine gun to, to protect you while you were uh, indisposed, shall we say. <laughs> You didn't want to get caught with your pants down, literally. <laughs> and so, um, and plus, we were all cross-trained. I was, you know, we, uh, you know, I was licensed to drive a tank. I can, uh, I qualified as a marksman with a with the cannon and machine guns. So we all cross-trained. But my primary uh, job was a loader, where I'd keep a machine gun full of ammo and the, keep loading the uh, shells in the cannon after we fired. And another, another interesting job is uh, whenever we found a hole in the ground, it was my, uh, my job to go down off the tank and go up to the hole and put a hand grenade into it to see if there was anybody in there. So, oh. Yeah, that, that's know. put a lot, of, a lot of pressure. I used yeah. to, uh, the uh, hand grenades had a four second fuse. You know, I was approaching the hole. I I let the uh, the handle go to start the timer on a fuse, and I'd hold it for two seconds and throw it in. That way, if there was somebody in there, they would have time to throw it back at me. So, so it was a, a, a little little hairy stuff. Yeah, that's definitely. Never know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. What did you, I don't know, I guess this is like a two-sided question. Like, what did you like most and hate most? <laughs> I don't know if there's like stuff to like. I don't know what your relationship was with your tank mates and, but what, like, what did you like most? Like, in any, other, like in any other situation, you made the best out of what you had. You know, if you were in a rear area inside a camp, you could relax and, you know, mm -hmm. If you're out in the uh, in the jungle, you know, it's, you got to keep your guard up constantly, 24 hours a day. You know, anything can happen at any time, so you got to be careful. And you know, the, the hardest thing was the constant, uh, constant, uh, constantly on the go. We hardly ever had a real break. So you know, they're not going to leave tanks sitting around in the parking lot. <laughs> and I could use them out in the uh, field somewhere. So we were always on the go with somebody. A lot of times we were called out. Twice we were called out to rescue infantry units who were pinned down. That's, uh, you know, when they heard us coming, they broke, you know, we rescued them. They, but, you know, it's, it's, you did the best you can do under the circumstances, put it that way. Um, okay, so, um, I guess my question is that, so I know obviously you communicate through letters, and I watched the interview that you did, um, yeah. and they asked about how you communicate with your family, you said letters, um, but I guess in the letters you mentioned, um, my, like, that, I know my grandpa had just gotten married, and Bill, like, came home and met yeah. someone, what yeah, was yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> what was it like to hear about 
all this stuff going on at uh, home while you were still away? Well, that was another thing. The, the day I left for Vietnam was the day my sister got married, you know, first husband. I, you know, I couldn't, couldn't be there. Okay. Yeah. Um, you were talking about your sister's wedding. Yeah, that the one I missed. Yeah. Yeah. That was the uh, the day I left for Vietnam on a troop ship out of San Francisco. Took us uh, twenty three days to uh, get there. Yeah, then we landed and uh, went to a temporary base camp. We started making uh, getting all our equipment. Out. So all our equipment had to be uh, unloaded and you know cleaned up and set up and you know I put the ammunition in the tanks and everything else and then we were ready to go out. You know, once we started going out, we hardly ever came back. One thing after another. Um. So I don't know. Grandpa said he felt guilty not being in the war. Well. His brothers were there. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> he it's really, silly, you know, I, you know, I, I would not feel guilty if I missed it either. So. <laughs> well, I don't it know. Was timing. It was just the time. He was four years older than me, and he was in the, he was in the reserves. So yeah, you know, he did something. Yeah. He you know, said if they, he said that if they had asked him, of course he'd gone. But he always felt. He 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 said he didn't like it because he felt guilty that you guys were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah brother, brother Bill too. He was there. Yeah, was it weird, like hearing that he came home? Like, were you ever like mad that you were home and everyone else was? Or oh yeah, constantly yeah. Why, yeah. why did they? Why did they pick me? But <laughs> yeah, I know it was healthy and uh, I was healthy and uh, there was no physical uh, reason for me not to get drafted. So. Well, back in those days, the draft was something you, you know, it was part of growing up. You either went to college or the army would uh, draft you. Or the, if you got in trouble, you messed up, the judge would tell you either two years in jail or, or join the army, one or the other. So I, I never had to make that choice, but <laughs> that, back in those days, it was an option. Yeah. Did you ever come home on leave? Uh, well, we were training. I took my training in Fort Hood, Texas, and I, that Christmas I was I was drafted in October. I came home a couple of days for Christmas that Christmas. Then uh, I went for more training in, in Maryland, Fort Lee, Maryland. That's where the regiment was being formed. So I we had uh, I had two weeks leave before I went to Vietnam. But once I went over, I didn't you know there's no going back. Did you get to come home earlier though? Cause you didn't come on leave or? No, it had nothing to do with it. Really? I did come home earlier the most cause I had the earliest draft date and they were, they were looking to turn over like, they, we had a one year tour of duty. So our, our tour that actually started when we left San Francisco. So. The 23 days that we spent at sea counted toward our tour. But I was I was one of the older guys in the company, and I was one of the earliest draftees. So, so they sent me home early, and uh, you know, so they got replacements in instead of all the replacing all at one time. They wanted to stretch it out, so the uh, new guys would learn from the older guys. So. But you know, I, I did come home a little early, a little bit early. Um, so I guess my other question about letters is, um, did you say different stuff to grab my, like my, your brother, than to your parents? And if so, how, like how, how are they different? <laughs> well, that's that was one of the reasons I, why I wrote to your brother, to your grandfather. To Bob, because I want I wanted to get things off my chest. And when I wrote to my parents, it would be one of these things. Oh, everything's fine. We're all we're all sitting around getting a suntan, you know. 
playing basketball and you know all that stuff. But, you know, I I would unload every once in a while. I, I would unload on Brother Bob. Just you know, you know, I wanted to get it off my chest and tell somebody mm -hmm. a couple letters there. But you you might notice that. But that was about it. Totally different letters from mom and dad and Bob. Yeah, totally different. Yeah. Grandpa said that your letters were like the reality versus what like the government was telling everyone. And like, yeah. I guess my, I guess the question like off of that is like, what was it like hearing what like everyone, like what the government was saying versus like actually experiencing like the reality? Wow. Well, it was a hard time, but like I said, we were out in the field most of the time, so we didn't have access to news, current news. You, know, you couldn't play a radio on at night, so you know. Well, well what you, would happen every three or four days? We get a the mail, and the army newspaper. They call the it's called the Army Stars and Stripes. So we would get the newspapers and with with the mail, and I like get three or four days in uh, worth of newspapers. So we used to sort them out by date, so we could read the news chronologically. We read we read the like three or four days news all in one sitting, but had to read it, you know, by date to get an idea of what's going on out there. That was the only uh, contact. You know, we didn't have radios or anything like that, that any kind of noise like that would give us away at night. So mm -hmm. that was about it. Mail, clean clothes every once in a while. Yeah, I heard my grandpa sent you underwear. Yeah. That's definitely no, yeah. a necessity. <laughs> that and whiskey. Better than most guys. Especially the infantry, they they had no chance to change. We had a tank. We had a, a duffel bag of full of clothes and clean clothes and change of clothes. But still, you know, like a shower was a luxury. I I could probably you know, probably count about twelve times in the whole year I took a shower, an actual shower. What we used to do was what they call a GI shower. You take your shirt off, get a hot water and a, a sponge, and just wipe yourself down. Every couple of days, you change your socks. So, one time, I got to laugh, it was funny, but we were inside a base camp one night. We were in a tent, and it was pouring rain during the monsoon season. And the tent, it was at dark at night, like 10 o'clock. And uh, the tent had like a concrete patio outside the door. So, so me and uh, the we decided to take a bath, take a shower in the rain. So we went out on the patio, got all soaked up and the rain stopped. So, <laughs> so we had to, the two of us were running around the base camp naked with our helmets looking for water to rinse, our, rinse ourselves off with. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. That's funny. Um, yeah. Okay. So I actually never knew that you got a bronze star and a purple heart. That's like, that's, yeah. a, that's crazy. Um, I don't know if you like, like to talk about it and if not, that's fine. But um, I just, you sent me like the certificate and it said that, I don't know what struck me was that you went to go get like guns for others but not yourself at first and yeah. then like what were you thinking in that moment because that's like well like like i said the, the the engine compartment in the back of the tank was on fire so we had to leave because of the burning diesel fuel well if that had been a gasoline engine i wouldn't be alive today because it would have been an explosion but it was diesel fuel so it burns but uh, after a few minutes, we were shooting back, and uh, there were air vents in the uh, between the engine compartment and the inside of the turret, and the burning diesel fuels. After a few minutes, started leaking into the turret and running under the floors and where the where the uh, 90 millimeter ammunition was stored. So, so we had to get out in case that blew up. So, so we uh, we got out and. Every, the other three guys were on the ground and nobody got a gun. So I, we had a couple of guns on top of the turret and I, you know, tossed them down to them. 
Well, it's, it's another story, but anyway, uh, when I got down, I didn't have a gun. So I went into the driver of the compartment, got his gun, and uh, you know, we were, there were other armored units behind us, so we ran back and you know got on the uh, armored, you know, the uh, personnel carriers, and uh, you know that's how we left the uh, the ambush site. It was a I actually ran out of ammo for my guns, and I borrowed a rifle off a guy who had a machine gun. So I kept shooting, and uh, after we left, I kept. He refused to give me any more ammunition because I wouldn't stop shooting. So <laughs> I was, I was, I was annoyed. Let's put it that way. Um. It describes you guys, I don't know, it, it describes you guys as like, you got awarded the Bronze Star for heroism. Do you think that describes you and your tank mates? Yeah, well, a little bit beyond the call of duty, shall we say. When we got hit, if we had just bailed out then, nobody would have said anything. But we stayed with it for a couple of minutes and fought back and, you know, did a busted them up pretty bad with the cannon, machine gun. But they came to a point where we had to leave when the burning fuel was leaking in. Otherwise, I I would have been happy staying there. But the one thing is, when I was on top of the tank getting the guns, I was hearing this popping noise. And uh, after we got back out of the ambush site, the guy driving the vehicle behind me came over to me and hugged me. He said that he didn't think I was going to make it. He was telling me that popping sound I was hearing with machine gun ammo bullets passing my head. So I was I was lucky. You know, it was a, some guy with a machine gun was trying to take me out, but he missed. So. That's crazy. Um, okay, so I looked at the, um, in your scrapbook, you had, yeah. uh, you like, ha had the re Vietnam wall rubbing of your replacement. Right. Yeah. Um, like, how, like, who was, like, do, did you know your replacement at all? No, I had no idea who he was because he came in after I had left. But for years, you know, when we used to go to the 11th Cavalry reunions, I was always asking around, trying to locate the guy who did take my place. And uh, I could never find him. But finally, I, somebody told me what happened. This guy was, uh, you know, six months into it. I left in the end of July, I think on January 6th. He got killed. But he was in the tank in my spot, and a rocket came through the sidewall and hit him directly. So, never knew him, didn't know until recently who he was. And it's just, if my tour had been six months longer, that would have been me. So, once again, I was very lucky. Um. What, like when you look back on the war and your experience, how do you think of it? Like, how do you think of your experience as a whole? Well, definitely a learning experience. It's a, I think, you know, I, I said in that video that the interview where you learn some things are, uh, you know, not that important. You learn the priorities, and, uh, <clears throat> and like I said, if, if in the police department, if I had a bad day, I I still have the picture on my wallet. But, you know, I take the uh, picture out, say uh, things could have been worse. So you get a whole new perspective on life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think. Uh, There's a term that veterans use it's called the Alive Day. That uh, day of that ambush. 
I don't know if you can see the picture, but. Oh yeah, in, that's also in the book, yeah, it was right? In the album, yeah. Yeah. I still carry my wallet to this day. So, like I said, when I'm having a bad day, I look at that, and things could be worse. And, you know, it's, I get at nighttime, but I have a hard time sleeping. Just trying to unwind. Sometimes I'm driving down a road and I come across a tree line. I think automatically, what they call a flashback. I think somebody's in the trees. They're looking to kill me. So, <laughs> and, yeah, that's that happens occasionally. But you know, it's it's part of a like they said the alive day. That's the day you, you should have died, but you didn't. So anything every day after that is a gift. So plus marriage, four kids. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, hit, yeah. reaching seventy five, and I think <laughs> I didn't think I was gonna reach twenty two, but <laughs> here I am, seventy five. Um, wait, actually, how old were you exactly when you were drafted? I forgot to I was, ask. Uh, well, I've been out of high school for two years when I got drafted. So I was 20 and I came home at uh, 22. I was older than most guys. Just, you know, like I said, I got out of high school. I was working for two years and the draft started. I didn't get drafted right out of high school, which most of the other guys that I worked with, you know, served with, they got drafted right out of high school. If they didn't go to college, they were, they got drafted. That's crazy. I was, I was about average two years older than most of the guys. That's really young. Yeah, my tank commander, that Sergeant Keita, he was like 12 years older than us, but he had been in Korea, the Korean War, and Vietnam. Wow. That's crazy. He I didn't realize. Career only guy. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And was that picture taken on the day of the ambush or was that, is that just a picture from the war? No, no, that's just, that picture I just showed you was Christmas day in 1966. So that, what I'm holding is a case of beer is our Christmas present. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I guess I just have one more question unless you have anything else. No. Okay. Um, so you obviously been through a lot and something that, you know, not many people can attest to, but, um, does your experience getting through something hard give you any wisdom you can share about how we can get through the uncertainty of today during the coronavirus? <laughs> I don't think there's any connection to the virus now. Just, the. Uh self-confinement that's the, that's a big problem but you know i didn't have that in the army or anything like that but like i don't know i guess like the i oh, the not, oh, yeah. not that this like exactly parallels but i guess there was like uncertainty in the war and, yeah. Well, yeah. currently with the virus is always the fear of getting it getting sick but nowadays they have you know most they have medications and you know, the you can, uh, majority of people survive, but, you know, if I had, if I got hit with that machine gun, you know, there's probably, uh, would, it would have been a different story. You know, there's not too, uh, don't recover too well after getting hit a couple times with, with a machine gun. It's, so it's, it's hard to say that different circumstances. Um, but like, what do you think got you through that time, I guess? Luck. <laughs> Pure, simple luck. You know, I get, twice I got hit in the head with shrapnel from somebody else's, uh, but I had a helmet on, so it just bounced off. So once again, I was lucky. So it's just, just a matter of luck. Like they say, when your time's up, that's it. Nothing you can do about it. You get that feeling, you know, what a, 
just keep on plugging because no matter what you do, it's not going to change anything. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. And I forgot one question. I'm so sorry. And this is the last one, I promise. Um, were you religious during the war? Because I know you grew up in a religious family, but did the war have an impact on your religious beliefs? Or uh, I guess over there, yeah, I, was, I think I only saw a chaplain once. But uh, there's, you know, there's no word Anything like that. But it's hard to say. I after I came home, I got to think about it, and my my thoughts were that uh, here I am, a Catholic kid taught to, you know, growing up taught not to kill, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I killed a few people. But then I think in the you know, while I'm out there praying to my God to help keep me safe, the guys that I killed were probably praying to their God to keep them safe. So, you know, that was my God better than theirs, or did I have a bigger gun and a better shot? So I don't, you know, I question uh, about the religious part of it in the end. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. This is actually really interesting. Yeah. Um, unless you have any other thoughts, I think that's like my questions, I guess. Yeah, that's all right. Um, thank you again for doing this. It was actually, it was super interesting and it's also yeah. really well, it's interesting to compare you and my grandpa's experiences during the war because they were obviously different. So, yeah, well, uh, he was lucky. I, I don't hold that against him. It was just that, you know, if uh, our ages had been reversed, he would have been over there and I would have been in the reserve. So it's just, it's just life. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank, and thank you for everything you sent over. It was actually amazing. I, I'll be sure to send it back. But Grandpa yeah, definitely... Time, yeah, take your time. Look it over. Okay, you know it was amazing. Questions? Yeah. You yeah. We... Questions? You can call me back. Okay. Thank you. All right. Say hello to your mom.